Hello everybody, it's a shuttle Sunday, you lucky people. This is where they let me loose for a good hour, just talking about something I'm very interested in, which is a space shuttle program. And we're also joined by another person who's very much in that clay-clination. Aren't you, Sawyer? Say hello, Sawyer. Hello, Sawyer. Um, <laughs> yes, uh, I mean, I always love talking about shuttle, and it's really fun right now going back through the early days and doing all my research back on it again and going, oh, yeah, and just re-sparking my love of this vehicle. We're also joined by Jack. Say hello, Jack. Yay, shuttle. It's shuttle Sunday. Yeah, like you said, Sawyer, this uh, has been a good excuse for me to go back and uh, reread slash re-listen to um, Bold Day Rise and uh, Into the Black um, and uh, yeah, the, all those excellent shuttle books. So let's let's just jump right into it. We only we're not we're not going to do like a four million hour episode. So most of this is going to be me not talking, so that we can hear all the cool shuttle stuff from Chris and Sawyer. I did actually think that when I was going through the resources for this, that I've actually got some very, very nice pictures of planes as well. So I thought, well, Jack will definitely want to be talking about those. It's the old SCA before they painted it with the color scheme. It's from its American Airline days. So that's, oh, yeah, that is that'll the, be fun. The top color scheme for that aircraft. And, I, and yes. Right, should we start with STS-2? Because what we did, what we did, a, a shuttle Sunday is an experiment with STS-1, and that was fun. We recorded it, and I'll make sure that once we've got, like, a collection, they'll go into, like, a, a special area of the channel where you can go through them in, like, some kind of order, which is the fun. That's why we're going to STS-2, 3, and 4 for this one. The reason why we're going to STS-2, 3, and 4 is because they are the final test flights. If you compare, a lot of people are into Starship right now, obviously, for the right reasons. And we can make comparisons with the way the test flights were conducted. In the case of the Space Shuttle program, Columbia launched four times on four missions to conduct the test flights to become operational. And the difference with Starship is, with Shuttle, they were crewed from the start, which we're never going to see again. It's amazing they actually got away with it when they did it with the Space Shuttle program. But that is exactly what they did. They launched them all crewed. And thankfully, they got through to the end of STS-4. And you'll see by the end of the shuttle Sunday on STS-4, the way they did a fanfare for it with President Reagan and Nancy Reagan, the First Lady, actually there to see, for the first time as well, three shuttles in the same place, which was Enterprise, Challenger, and Columbia. So that's something to look forward to. Let's, first of all, let's get going, because we've got a lot of resources. I'm going to do this in two ways. The first one, I'm going to just basically, I've downloaded a lot of pictures from L2 and all over the place where, obviously, that, that's not L2 picture, that's obviously out there because that's the mission logo for STS-2. Let's talk about this mission while we've got the logo up, which was a test flight again, just two people on board, a commander and a pilot, Joe Elgin and Richard Tully, and they launched from 39A, as you can guess, they're all from 39A to start with the Space Shuttle program. This launched on November the 14th, 1981. This is not far after STS-1 if you can take it into those parameters of time scale and the gaps between missions. But with all these missions, STS-2, 3, and 4, they increased to what they could do with the shuttle program. And that, this time, it involved the counter arm and involved actual experiments because the space shuttle was meant to be a big space truck that would be launching regularly, which is never going to happen, but it, that's what the goal was, with satellite launching and retrieval. And of course, with retrieval and including the actually deployments as well, you needed a robotic arm. And this is back in the early 80s. So this is all kind of like, wow, sci-fi stuff, which is really cool. I'm going to bring up the next picture because it shows the two people in question. And look, by the way, still the white external tank. That's why the thumbnail for this short Sunday is still with the white external tank. It's the last time you'll see it. We're going to go on to the orange one, the unpainted orange uh, external tanks after this. Because this is the only one uh, twice they use the painted external tank sts1 sts2 it's white. you can see that yeah it's white it's white, <laughs> it's white. Uh, we've got loads of photographs here these some would be about water because i just downloaded so many of them by the way if you're a member of our discord i will dump all these photographs into discord so you can get to see it if you're not an lt member or whatever i like this because this is a turnaround picture you can see some I always find some um, some kind of coincidences there with the TPS. When we start looking at the spaceships, uh, the starships at um, Starbase, you see how they're working on TPS. And you can see here they were doing the post-STS-1 
and preparations for STS-2 TPS work here, and it was looking very nice by this stage. And when, when Jack and Sean and Mary takes pictures of the TPS, the ships at Starbase, I start seeing, oh yeah, that looks a lot better. That looks a lot better. And people are going, what are you on about, Chris? How would you know? I've got all this history of TPS on the special, which reminds me of what looks good and what doesn't. And you can see where they're getting close to this kind of like, they're very similar to me. Jack, what do you think? When you look at TPS photographs of the space shuttle now, like in this photograph here, do you start thinking, oh, yeah, that rings a bell with how Starship is now having this kind of like black tiles all over the place? Yeah, absolutely. Obviously, there's there's uh, some differences in the composition of the tiles, and they're obviously different shaped. But uh, no, I, I very frequently will wonder, you know, one of the issues, I don't know if issue is the right word, one of the challenges with the shuttle's TPS tiles were, you know, each individual tile is famously unique, and the a tile in one location versus a tile on the same location on a different orbiter uh, might be completely different, or just slightly different, or different enough that it's not just like, oh, we'll pop in a new tile. So, airship definitely has the advantage of um, more uh, standardization among its tiles, mostly, I assume, because it's just a massive cylinder. But I do always wonder, you know, how much hand labor goes into the custom tiles, like, say, for the flap arrow covers, or the spots between dome welds or the nose cone things like that like i'm i'm sure that there are a lot of similar challenges between the two vehicles um and hopefully starship will become the shuttle 2.0 that we all want it to be and will have learned from from everything that uh, that they did on the on the space transportation system program i have a i have a burning question before we finish chris i'm not going to yes. ask it now but uh, but when we get to the whole Reagan uh, speech thing, I, I have a I have a question, and that relates to all of like Starship, Shuttle 2.0, all of this. So let's I'll let you keep going because we we have a lot to get through. But uh, remind me if I forget at that point about my my quote unquote burning question. I will do because that sounds intriguing. So I'm looking forward to that. <laughs> well, we're talking about tiles, by the way. If I yes, could just jump in. Yes. If I recall, it was STS2 where. They were uh, filling up the RCS tanks and spilled some of it, which caused them to have to take tiles off of the vehicle and remanufacture them, basically, and re-add them back on. Oh, yes. I mean, this is something that I've actually... I'm, 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 my mind was wandering to how the TPS became more of a, um, a process. I don't know if that's the right word for it, more of a process during the latter missions. To me though, I, I looked back on these photographs and I just basically looked more in depth at the TPS, probably from the Starship in the back of my mind. And it does seem very similar though. It, the, the wing leading edge looks similar. This wing, I'll actually use my cursor, you'll see it on the screen because it's quite highlighted out. This is um, reinforced carbon carbon, the RCC, wing leading edge. And of course this is now infamous because it was the left wing of Columbia that took an impact, was it around here, Sawyer? I, I'm it was trying... panel eight, I believe. Yeah, so around here. Um, and it literally punched a hole in the RCC, which people were thinking there was no way. This is why people were panicking at the time when they saw the strike, because they've seen debris strikes before. Uh, it's on topic, because this is Columbia, by the way, so this is the same shell. And they actually punched a hole, and it was basically the velocity of the firm, even though it was lightweight, was enough of an impact to punch a hole into Columbia's RCC. And then obviously during re-entry, the hot plasma got inside that cavity and basically just burned the wing off from the inside out. It was horrendous. But that yeah. is the same thing. It's, it's RCC there, and then you've got TPS tiles here, on the flaps as well, everywhere. Part really incredible. If we'll ever see uh, a, a separate material integrated into Starship's heat shield, similar to how the shuttle's heat shield was, you know, the thermal blankets, the tiles, and the reinforced carbon-carbon. Like, will we ever see a Starship with a reinforced carbon-carbon cap on the nose cone instead of the incredibly complicated and seemingly labor-intensive nose cone tiles that they have spent so much time working on, Ship 29, for example? Um, I, think a, I think a Starship with reinforced carbon-carbon or a similar, you know, just a mix of different materials of the heat shield depending on what that part of the heat shield needs to withstand, uh, would look cool. Anyways, you know I the, digress. You know the beauty of that, though? The, the beauty of that point is I, I could guarantee you 
there are some SpaceX engineers who are working on Starship who have absolutely looked back on the space shuttle program as far as TPS well, goes. They probably even look back on during their own programs with Dragon because they've got that Picker X, haven't they? Which is their um, heat shield for the Dragon heat shield. And they probably looked at that data as well. The wealth of data over the past decades of spaceflight is really playing in to the future vehicles we're seeing coming up now, including Starship. Remember, Starship's going to be a crude vehicle before long. They have to get it right. Never mind on just these Starlink Pez dispenser missions, <laughs> you know, right. the refueling. Didn't they even, I think they even flew some Starship tiles on a Dragon. I forget if it was a cargo or a crew oh. Dragon. Sawyer, does that They did, about? yes. Yeah. Nice. Um, oh, I'm trying to remember which one it was, but yes. So yeah, lots of, lots of TPS data. I mean, hey, it's important. I'm going to the nurse. I remember you mentioned the nurse. It, sorry, I can't remember the material. So I'm zooming in so much, it's ruining resolution. But you can see there the nurse of the orbiter wasn't thermal protection tiles and it wasn't RCC. I don't believe it was like a rubber cap, wasn't it, Sawyer? Um, I'm trying to try, think of the material. Uh, I'm trying to think. It wasn't, it wasn't RCC? I'm pretty sure it oh. wasn't. I, I remember that it being a it big... Was. Yeah, I'm pretty sure it's the that is RCC. Is it a rub, cause yeah, I remember thinking it's a rubber cap. Let's double check that because if it's an RCC, it's a different. It's, it looks the same color, but it's not the panels as such. It was like a cap. I remember that because I remember seeing so many close ups. It there was like scratches on them sometimes, and they said, "We'll leave it. It doesn't make any difference. It's fine." Yeah, um, nose cone right along now. with other areas such as leading lead. I can't talk. The nose cone along with other areas such as the wing leading edges. And nose gear landing doors relied on reinforced carbon carbon to withstand the intense heat generated during reentry. The huge chunk of RCC then, because I remember seeing the nose cap taken off once, and it's like a massive, like car-sized cap, and it is really deep as well. I mean, it has to be if you're thinking about the reentry; it has to survive. But that was something they never had a problem with. It was amazing that the nose cap never provided any issues that I ever saw compared to pretty much every other area of the TPS, including the tail. The rudder speed brake, sorry. <laughs> you get told off by short people, you call it a tail. It's a rudder <laughs> speed brake. But it's. I also want to bring this one up, Sawyer, because this is great. You can see that 39A was still kind of still not really in its shuttle phase yet. It was oh, still yeah. The modification. Look, it's like really interesting how you can see how they were converting at the time and this boys and girls if you're a new person to space shuttle program but you've been following spacex because spacex is cool uh this is the same tower this is the same fixed service structure that was modified at 39a for falcon at uh, for spacex during their lease this is the same tower they've not demolished it and put a new tower up there it's the same tower they demolished this part which is the returning service structure which was basically just for space shuttle Provided the payload, you can see here, the payload would go in there sometimes. Not all the time, but sometimes would go in there. They'd rotate it and then put it into the cargo bay here. And that's how it did, but it was mainly for weather protection and things like that. I know they'd roll out with some payloads, but some payloads they brought up down here and then brought it up into the RCC, our, our rotating service structure, and then rotated it and closed it with the payload bay doors. And that's how I did it. I digress. In fact, there, that's but... the... That's the first shot in the NSF live stream intro. Is that structure rotating away from a shuttle? Yes. Uh huh. And it that is, is a, a deliberate. That is a deliberate choice. And fun fact: in real life, it did not take three seconds. It, it was quite a <laughs> lengthy forty-five minute process. <laughs> way, yeah. way, way off the rails here. But that <laughs> shot is actually meticulously retimed in multiple places so that the spotlights turn on with the beat. And it's it was a not. It was not a trivial edit. <laughs> <laughs> I've got another picture here I'm going to bring up. Look at this. This is rollout with a big Xeon. Is it Xeon lights? I keep getting that wrong. Xenon? Xenon lights. There we go. They had a massive lights. I remember when they rolled out. In future short Sundays, we'll get to ones where we've got our own photographers there, which is after Columbia, uh, after return to flight from Columbia. And there's some amazing shots from inside the VAB on the high gantry. It was Larry Sullivan usually. On the high bay, on the um, VAB high gantries, looking out to the doors, and the orbiter was rolling out on the crow transporter, and you could see the press site to the right, 
and you see the massive floodlights. And all I could think of was this is like a Hollywood, bo- you know, the, the walk the, the actors do to the Oscars with all the <laughs> photographers with the flashing cameras and what have you and the big flashlights. It really is amazing. I will, I will save that for a future so, so, short Sunday because it really is cool. But I think we want to get onto some launch stuff here. So let me bring up some launch photographs and I'll bring up a video as well. This cool. is cool. Fun fact, those xenon light bulbs are like grenades. Like, they are highly pressurized and extremely dangerous. So if you ever have to change one, it's like put on a full-on, like, uh, bomb disposal suit. Like, <laughs> it, it, they're not they're not messing around. I had to mess with, I had to change one out in film school, like, for a lighting class. Uh, super cool lights. Anyways, way off the rails. Sorry, go ahead. Nice, no, cool. This is WB-57. The photographs from high altitude, they had a lot of these, especially in the early missions. If you think about it, again, Starship relevant. Starship had WB... No, I didn't think for IFT3, did they? Didn't have it for IFT3, but for IFT1 and 2, they had the WB-57s out there for the high altitude shots. And I remember these photographs back in the early days of the internet, back when there was FARC and DIG and places like that, which no one even knows about now because I think they've all gone defunct. People would put these on and say, look at this shuttle picture from the ISS. I'm thinking, there's no <laughs> way <laughs> that is from the ISS. Really? <laughs> I mean, yeah, but that's how they do it. Oh, my word. I've got another one here, actually. I forgot about Dig. Um, it's like something awful. Like so many of those old, early <laughs> internet forums. Yeah, I know. There was like, um, they used to come on our forum and say, you've been dug. I'm like, what? Because <laughs> you've been on dig. I'm like, you've been dug. It's like some claim to fame. Like... Oh, that site. Oh, now I remember. <laughs> yeah. Wow, well, that, that is, just fired that a neuron cool. I haven't used in a while. That is a cool picture there. I'm going to find the actual launch video because the launch video is very cool if I can work out where my folders. Here we go. All right. Let's it looks very similar, one. by the way, to the recent launch 652 with the uh, F-22 flying with Falcon 9. Oh, you see yeah. the wing. You can kind of see the wing in that shot too. It's very reminiscent. It's really cool. There's so many of these. We, I mean, we're gonna. We've got all the missions in L2, as you can imagine. And there's so many photographs that you may have not seen before. I mean, there's some where you just think, "Wow, would that really happen?" Because it was a very sporty program. You think about it. There was so much risk. I feel so much more calmer now with dragon launches. I, I just don't get the same feeling I had with shuttle launches. For shuttle launches, it was like you, you could put your what I watch, whatever you call it, your watch on with your heartbeat showing. And I hated to think what it had been like during the space shuttle program because I actually felt quite ill after a space shuttle launch. There's just so much pressure involved with hoping it would go well, especially with crew on board. I mean, it's ridiculous. But with Dragon, I'm a lot more reassured. Anyway, I'm going to just stop talking because I hopefully, Jay and Gage in our back. I wish I should give a shout out, by the way, in the back room there. This will play audio. Let's see if it'll... Um... There we go. Chat, can you hear audio? We have control of the... Countdown now being conducted by the one sequences on board the orbiter. T minus 20 yeah, seconds. You can hear audio. Counting. The SRB hydraulic power unit has started. The SRB nozzles have the need to start station. Coming up on 10, 2 minus 10, 9. The adult remain engine start. We have main engine start. Minus 3, 2, 1. We have a system. We have a system of the solid rocket boosters and system. Lift off of America's space shuttle, and the space shuttle has moved the power. Houston now controlling the mission control confirmed roll maneuver starting. 20 seconds thrust is good. 25 seconds roll maneuver completed. 30 seconds Columbia now one nautical mile in altitude. 35 seconds status check mission control by flight director Neil Hutchinson going to go in 40 seconds. Columbia Houston, you're going 40. Forty-eight seconds, we're on an inch down from X. Ignore the master alarm, Columbia. Coming up on Crater Mountain. the master alarm. Oh, no. the vehicle. Mark one minute, Columbia now five nautical miles in altitude, three nautical miles down range, velocity now reading 2300 feet per second. One minute, eight seconds, pass through Max Q. Columbia still looking good, throttling engines back to 100%. Columbia now, 9 nautical miles in altitude, 6 
nautical mile downrange, velocity now reading 3,000 feet per second. Notice the NASA comments here, just facts, facts, facts. The audio Mark, quality. One minute, 35 seconds. Columbia now 14 Houston. nautical miles, now to two, 10 nautical miles down range. Houston, now you can Wave expect any bad sounds. One, just sounds one right. minute, 45 seconds, coming up Divilious. on negative seats, where altitude too high for ejection seat. Negative seats. In the old Quindar towns. Yeah. Mark, one minute, 55 seconds. Columbia now 21 nautical miles, now altitude 18 nautical miles down range. Velocity now reading 5,000 feet per second. Standing by now for solid rocket booster separation confirmation. 205. Roger, copy. PC less than 50. Okay, looks like we got a good SM. Confirm good solid rocket booster separation. Smooth as glass, Houston. Smooth as glass, Houston. That was a big thing, by the way. After SRB... Um, after the SRBs came off, the the class the first two minutes is very rough, very rocky, very rare, lots of vibrations. But after the SRBs were jettisoned, it was a very very smooth ride, and that was just basically on the liquid engines of the SSMEs, which was really cool. I did like this part. I remember it back when I was going back through it. That they had a master alarm, which is never a good thing. They had a master alarm, and Houston said, "It's keep carry on. There's no problem." And the commander angle just goes, "Okie doke." <laughs> <laughs> you're going at, on you know this massive thrust of a space shuttle launch you're probably thinking as a you know it's sts2 it's the second flight of the vehicle there's there's a very good chance you could die on this thing and he goes okie doke it's just a different breed of person it really is i'm going to show the landing video as well now because the landing was really cool by the way just really quick while we're mentioning yes. the srbs it's not really on a positive note but uh, this was the first time that they witnessed a uh, burn through in one of the O rings. That's right, yes. In Which... fact, no, you're right, because that was the first time they'd noticed it again several times afterwards, but they kept on clearing, didn't they? They kept on yep. clearing it, thinking it wasn't a big concern. Another fun fact, you just made me think of fun facts, and that wasn't a fun fact, but it was a fact, <laughs> is that the idea was when the space shuttle program was being designed, the first initial missions, they were hoping that this would be a Skylab reboost mission. So that's kind of yes. SpaceX related because Polaris is looking to reboost Hubble. And the way they did it was, unfortunately, the, the delays in the program meant that Skylab had already come down by the time we even started launching Space Shuttle, so they couldn't do it. But that was initially going to be STS-2's mission. I, I was about to say, I'm going to go through the, the landing in a second, but I should show some on-orbit pictures, maybe. I think I've got some here. One second. Because this is important. This is the important part of what this test flight was. Here we go. This was the debut of the remote manipulator system, the space, they call it the SRMS, which is the Shuttle Remote Manipulator System. There is one on the ISS called the SSRMS, which is the Space Station Remote Manipulator System. And this was the one arm they had on the orbiter in the cargo bay, and they used to te they tested it out on this mission, which is very important. They were hoping to go for a longer mission, but they had a, I think it was a fuel cell issue. So can you remember what the issue was? Um, yeah, I'm trying to recall if it was the APU or a fuel cell. I know they had to cut the mission short. Uh, it was meant to be a five day mission. I, I think they came back. I want to say it, it was, was fuel, fuel cell. cell. Yeah, ah, there you go, sir. I just looked it up. Yeah, it's fuel cell. Which is interesting because that was probably very useful for them. They needed to know that they could cut a mission short and still have the assets in place to cover the landing part of the mission. I've got some more pictures here actually one second can you one imagine second. what that must be like though like to be wanting to fly in space for so long to be i mean like joe angle for example was backup crew on a whole bunch of apollo missions like to finally get your space flight and then you only get to spend you know a fraction of the time you thought you were going to get to on orbit yeah but it's... they still accomplished 90 percent of what they <laughs> were planning on achieving this is a real photograph, by the way. It didn't <laughs> happen on STS-1 for some reason, but every other mission, the crew would do their portrait picture and then a fun one. They'd always do a fun one. There are some amazingly fun ones in future missions that I'll be showing you on future short Sundays, but I've, 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 that, I've, I've put my out. When did that stop? Was that after Challenger or Columbia that they stopped doing that? Or? Think it, I don't think it ever stopped. I remember... Even the ISS expeditions after the space shuttle, they did a, like a Star Wars one. 
but they're all dressed up as Jedis and stuff. Oh, yeah, that was it... the NASA posters for each of the different yes. expeditions. They also did it for the final shuttle flights in all of its poster glory. Oh, it's really good. Um, I'm going to make sure I can bring up the right thing. Here we are. There we go. This is a landing. I've got landing photographs as well, boys and girls, so don't worry. But this is cool as well. This is a landing. Here we still go. Mad. I'm still mad I never got to see a shuttle land at Oh, I've got a photo. I'll show you later, Jack. That I, it's like Jack in another dimension. It would have been you. I'll show you later. I won't spoil it. <laughs> all right, all right. Okay. And if I'm not mistaken, uh, STS-2 was unique in a way in terms of re-entry and landing in that um, Joe Engel flew re-entry, if not completely, mostly by hand. Like, yeah. It's usual for, for an orbiter pi uh, commander to... Actually, fly the shuttle for a, you know by hand for a little bit of time um, during Five, entry and or landing. Three, but in this case, they were testing out a variety of maneuvers, uh, and so Joe Engel can say that he's one of the few people to actually pilot an orbiter all the way down to the ground, which is insane. Yeah, during the hack, the control, the unofficial I've noticed a lot of times that the, the, the commander to pilot to commander, they both get to fly. Hours, 13 minutes, 10 seconds. Yeah, you're right. Usually it is the heading alignment circle is where the pilot will take the flight. And I believe maybe occasionally around the S turns, but... Yes. I've just the shuttle convoy is another shuttle Sunday coming up. They were a ragtag group of strange trucks that you will love when you see close up. Like, Jack. Yeah, I got to I got to see one of them. Oh my god! There <laughs> she is. <laughs> Why did they ever repaint it? Oh my word! It looks so cool. I don't know if I've got a wider shot. But I've got some photographs anyway. Now it's that one. That's that's a shot basically of the SCA already waiting. To pick up Columbia, to take her back to KSC. Um, the photographs. Let me see and get the photographs in question. I don't know, I if, know it's, I've got... if it's just like nostalgia or what, but all of this still looks futuristic to me in a weird retro way. But yeah, just seeing both of these machines, the SCA and Columbia. Oh my gosh! Nine oh five, right? Yes. Just beautiful. Although the really tailcone always bothered me. Tailcone will always bother me. I know they needed it in, in yada yada, but the, the few flights they did without the tailcone, yeah, that's what I'm talking about. <laughs> What's wrong with the tailcone? It just, I don't know, it just bothers me aesthetically. It just looks weird and wrong. Like, I want to see the orbiter as the orbiter should exist, which is not with the tailcone. Like, I, I'm, I'm not saying I dislike the tailcone or I hate it. Like, I understand why it exists. It makes sense to me. But the few flights they did... Um, to test aerodynamics without the tail cone. Like, that is the canonical shuttle look. Anyways, I'll shut up. I've just realized we've got we've got people actually doing super chats. We don't expect these things. A Raptor side, I don't expect them, but it always happens, which is crazy. But there's, like, a large audience in there. So it's kind of like, wow, well, thank you, and it's really cool. This is, like, just a fun shuttle Sunday, and I've got Matt's. Hats off to Matt's. Matt's Grosley, who's gifted 10 red team memberships. We've got Dan Elgin, who's gifted a red team membership. We've got Coco Katz. We get a red team membership, and Ryan with a super chat asking shuttle had metalized tiles between the actuate actuation surfaces. Blah. Metalized tiles, but Sawyer, do you? Am I finding a shuttle fact? I don't know, or am I just not reading that right? Let me read that again on screen. Shuttle had metalized tiles in between the actuation surfaces. They had gap fillers. They had gap fillers. Right. They were, were metalized. They were like plastic strips. The, a fun thing for a future show Sunday is STS 114 where Steve Robinson went on an EVA underneath the belly of the uh, Discovery to pull out a protruding gap filler and then proclaimed on the loop, this big patient is now cured. I <laughs> remember distinctly. <laughs> that was so cool. <laughs> And that was the first flight after, that was a return to flight mission too. So there was extra, you know, yeah. concern with making sure those tiles and the heat shield was all good. Is that, is that gap filler, the, the frizzy or is that something else? I know frizzy is a thing. 
It was like a big plastic card. It was like a, a bigger than a credit card, but between the tiles had gap fillers, basically because there was gaps between the tiles. And that's what stopped them crashing into each other, vibrating into each other, whatever. And there was like a red glue um, that basically inserted it between the tiles. So when Steve Robinson, I asked him, I interviewed him about it, in fact, afterwards, and he, he laughed when I brought up what he said on the loop, but he said it did look like the shuttle was bleeding because you pull out this gap filler, it's covered in this red glue, and it does look like the gap filler is covered in blood. It's weird. <laughs> it really is. But um, it was awesome because it was, a, it was a shuttle astronaut being like me, you know, almost like... Um, giving it like some personality. Oh, the orbiter needed curing. It's like, I'm a doctor. I'm going to go out and cure the, the orbiter. It was really cool. And uh, yeah, Steve Robinson, great. He was a brilliant astronaut as well. Retired now, obviously. Apocalypse Cow, by the way, is gifted five very memberships. I'm going to keep reading them out if I see them, but thank you very much. If we don't expect them, they're all going crazy now. Here we Call go. All are the best. Also, if you're <laughs> hearing my dog squeak her chew toy in the background, I apologize. Oh, I thought that was you. It's adorable. I thought that was you with the... Well, I mean, I, I also <laughs> have a... I also have a squeak toy, but I have not been using it right now. Oh, Ryan's got a disc. He's put in Discord a picture of shooting a pic of a metalized tile. I'm going to have a look at that, Ryan. Um, but thanks also to Bob Fillmore. He's gifted five rotation memberships. Don't expect it. And it's a very small audience compared to what we get on Starbase Live. So you are just amazing supporters. It really is appreciated. Ryan, can you ping me in where it is? Because if I start looking through the Discord, I will start talking and forget I'm talking live on air. Oh, and might, the rare... might mumbling. The rare opportunity to ping someone while live. Yeah. Excellent. Ping me, ping me where you are, uh, Ryan, because I don't know where, which channel I'll be looking at in the Discord, but if you ping me, um, I will see the notification and I'll have a look at that for you. Because that's yeah, I'm intriguing. Looking at some shuttle documentation here, and it looks like there was metal in that area. Oh. Here we go. That's intriguing. Right. Uh, I, I don't want to bring that up without your permission, but if uh, maybe we'll, we'll keep that in the back burner one day and continue on with SS2 on. You've intrigued me, Ryan, and you, that, that gets points. You get many bonus points for intriguing me about something I might not know about because that is not a gap filler. I know that for a fact, so that's really interesting. Cool. Anyway, STS2. I think that's STS2 in the bag. We should move on to STS3 because that's even more fun. If you think oh. STS-2 was fun, STS-3 is real fun. Anybody in chat want to guess why STS-3 was fun? And the first person to get it will get a shout-out. I'm waiting for it. I'll give it a try, because it takes me about 10 seconds for my voice to go through to the internet to come out to the stream and then come back again. So we'll see if anybody gets the, the word of the day for STS-3. The word of the day... Or why it was fun. Not the orange tank. No, it was the orange tank debut, but it's not that was that wasn't the fun iconic thing about STS3. I'm intrigued that people might not know what it was. Because that'd be fun then to show them. Yeah, oh, honestly, I'm drawing, oh, Gwen's I'm drawing got it. a blank. Gwen's got it. Gwen's got it. The wheelie landing. Yes. Uh-huh. Thank you, Gwen. Yes, that's the, the fun thing about that one. <laughs> Let me just try and do my folders and see how to put anything on screen that I shouldn't do. <laughs> One second. Uh, da, 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 I'm just going to put that there and that there. And then we're going to go to the browser this time. Now that's what we're going to do. So that's just three. I, I always tell you where I get these photographs from. A lot of the photographs are just out there and saved because they've been deleted since from like historical archives. A lot of them are from people who worked on the space shuttle program. We've got 900 photographs from Sean. Our very own Sean um, got us 900 uh, United Space Alliance photographs, which we'll be dumping into L2 over the coming weeks. It's going to take forever, but it's going to be well worth it. And I was like, oh, this is amazing. So well done to Sean Doherty, who our Starbase photographer, who got us all those photographs. But this is an example. For STS-3, uh, we have all this section here where we've got all these photographs. Um, look at the tiles on this. That's not good, is it, Sawyer? Uh, white sands. No, that is not. Yeah, white sands. I think we started with the landing photo because the landing was such an iconic thing. But there's lots and lots of um, awesome photographs in here which you can blow up in full size. I want to get to the, the launch first. Uh, oh, by the way, no, I'm going to do it now. Jack, this is you in a different dimension. Yeah, absolutely. That, <laughs> what, that? White, sands, <laughs> white sands is such a beautiful place to imagine seeing a shuttle land there. I mean... Yeah, if I had a time machine, right? Yeah, what a place! Look at this. These were, the, I think, they were the NASA TV 
cameras, I believe, the, the little small gantries they built. This is White Sands. It was all temporary. It was the only time they landed at White Sands. I should do the launch first. So I'll come back to it's, all this. It's basically. amazing that that little yellow gantry can support the entire weight of the nose wheel of the shuttle. <laughs> <laughs> uh, sorry, you got beaten to that one. <laughs> uh, yeah, seriously. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, I was I was reading about the thermal protection system, trying to see if there was anything in my literature about that. But yeah, white. It's also interesting with white sands in that. To save money, they decided not to truck everything over to White Sands, but they actually trained it or railed it. I don't know the right terminology there. They brought it by train. Yes, that's right. Yes. And uh, we'll go back into that first page. Remind me to go back to that first page because that shows the kind of like mass of equipment there to get there because they had no uh, mate D mate device at White Sands. They had one in California, they had one at KC, obviously because that was expected there were two primary landing sites. But for White Sands, they needed to bring in special cranes, very star uh, to lift the orbiter onto the back of the SCA. Just this mission to outline it, this was March 22, 1982. This was Jack Lorismer and George Fullerton, very, very famous astronaut. And this was the third flight of the orbiter. And this was, again, the increasing what they were doing with this vehicle. I believe this mission lasted, um, I think it was seven days. Yes, uh, no, it actually lasted eight days. It was planned for seven days, but lasted eight days. So this is now the record for the space shuttle. Um, I'm going to get back onto the photographs here. Here we go. It was almost eight days on the dot. <laughs> yeah, it was. Yeah, I'm just looking through eight days and four minutes, which is incredible. There we go, launch photograph. Everyone loves the launch photograph. Look at this. Look at the SS... This is the cool shots of the launch where you get the three SSMEs, the RS-25s, with their blue flame coming out compared to the rock yeah. star. We're just going to make noise and make a lot of power. <laughs> SRPs, <laughs> you know. Shots like that are part a very large part of the reason why I personally, and I'm sure many others, spent an inordinate amount of money to catch Artemis 1, uh, those insane blue shock diamonds from the space shuttle main engines. Oh, just gorgeous. It is. Really is. I'm just thinking, you know, with today's cameras, what the space oh. shuttle, what you could have all caught with the space shuttle launches with new technology today. Right, we've seen it's, that it's different with SLS too because of the way the tail service masts on the um, mobile launch platform are mm. and just the way the engines engines are situated sort of down inside the platform versus with the shuttle they're just right there <laughs> they're, yeah. and they're off to the <laughs> side they're like there's a good amount of separation between the srbs so you can still uh, yeah it's just uh what a vehicle really cool lots of launch photographs here in fact this might be even better look at this there's some re you can see the thrust profile is still coming out there Really cool. And again, 39A still looking like it's still in its Apollo era in some parts. They're still modifying it. They've changed it quite a lot during the years. You'll see it in future short Sundays how they modified it. That's a cool photograph. Look at this. This feels like the early like CRS 10, 11, that time when you still had the rotating service structure partly being demolished next to the actual yes. fixed service structure. Yeah. Same kind of vibe. I wonder if people look back at Starbase in like five years' time and go, I remember Tower 1. <laughs> what on earth was that? That was the right mess. <laughs> like, we're going, I mean, it looked great at the time. <laughs> absolutely. I mean, I every now and then, you know, I have like the widget on my home screen or whatever that shows me photo, like old photos that I've taken. And every now and then I'll see something from the Hopper era or from it, like SN8. And I'm like, my God, <laughs> it looks <laughs> So much different already. You better believe in five years' time we'll have a similar vibe about the imagery that's being created now. Let's keep going through photographs. This is cool. On orbit photographs, you can see the mid deck being used here. This is where the space shuttle had like you had this flight deck, which is quite small. I mean, anyone who's been inside a space shuttle would be like, "This must be massive with all the cargo bay and whatever." You know, it's not that. It's the front part, of the orbiter, and the flight deck is very small. And they've got a, a next floor below it, which is the mid deck, and that's where all the experiments were. And you could put the crew on there. There's only two crew members on this one, but on the seven mission, on the seven crew member missions, that they had four down on the mid deck. If you if someone like you know appears out of the ether 
and is like, I'm a genie, you get to fly on a space shuttle, but you have to fly on the mid-deck. Would you do it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'll do it. Yeah. I'll do it. I mean, there's still the tiny little porthole window on the hatch, so there's, you know, a little bit of a view down there. But yeah, I'm, you're in I'm a space really a... shuttle. Why not? <laughs> I'm not claustrophobic or anything like that, so yeah, I would absolutely do it. But I would definitely be bummed. I was in the mid deck and not the uh, not the cabin. <laughs> also, one thing that's I think visibly absent from these photos is the onboard restrooms, which broke <laughs> after their first use on this flight. So yeah, yeah, this is in this is interesting because they had a they we're on SDS-3, aren't we? So this is where they had, there's a story behind it saying that when the fuel cell had the issue, that meant they couldn't get the water supply and they had potable water on board, but they didn't trust it. So they didn't drink it. Or the other story was they drunk it and they got sick. And they, is this I think... The, is this the one where there was the hydrogen in the water or something like that? Or is that that's like right, yeah, it got Yeah, mm -hmm. it got into the fuel cell, so they couldn't, they couldn't get the, the proper water supply. Uh, we, we're out of order with these photographs because we've got, like, people bring in people join the l2 thread and bring in their own photographs which might be out of thing but it's just really cool to see this i love this photograph this is so lovely this is coming out of the rpf this is rollout before launch we Beautiful. can see how they brought them in and all the gantries they expected before the space shuttle program that this would be just like a normal aircraft hangar and then they realized they couldn't do it that way and that's where the rapid reusability went out the window Part of me kind of wishes they transported Starship horizontally, just because I feel like it would look cooler than being transported vertically. But could it do the bend uh, um, to the launch site at Highway Four? Could it? Would it? Would it make the bend? They might need like a segmented SPMT situation. I I have no idea. i I'm, It's not going to happen, but it's fun. <laughs> and then to see it lifted from horizontal, kind of like you see there in the uh, in the VAV. Yeah, that would be insane. Yeah. Dead special cranes. And, oh, this is where Jack did the um, the live stream from the California Science Museum. Yep. It was the and, same um, fixture. <laughs> yeah, no, but that is that the same fixture they use at KSC? And I'm going, there's, there's no way it can be. They wouldn't, it looks brand new. And they wouldn't have sent it all the way from KSC. And then you brought the person on because yes, it's the one they use at KSC. I was like, damn it. <laughs> yeah. It's been a, I got to check my photos. I think they it. also use. Oops, sorry. Go ahead. No, I was going to say, I, I got to check my photos. I think that's what they also used for the retirement to get all of them off of, you know, like the barges and stuff in particular, Enterprise with the Intrepid. I believe that was also the same mechanism. They just kind of shipped it around towards the end of the program to wherever it was needed. Really cool. And the cost of big cranes, which is still there. They've modified the cranes for SLS where they had to lift the core stage over to the high bay from the transfer aisle, which is where they rolled all them in. Same thing with SLS, but just different vehicles. There's cool photographs here. I'm going to bring up the videos in a second. The video's a bit shorter this time, so obviously we're going to concentrate on the landing part. In fact, let's do it now, because we're going to be here for hours otherwise. Right, SGS3. Hello, hello. Show it on screen, please. Thank you. <laughs> we are here for main engine ignition. Eight, seven, six, six. We have main engine ignition. Three, two, one, zero. Lift off. We do have lift off. Power clear. Roll it over, Houston. Roger, Columbia rolling. Houston now controlling. Mission control confirms roll maneuver starting. Very cloudy launch. Point of the blue skies. 20 seconds. Thrust looks good. Roger, sounds good. 26 seconds, roll maneuver completed. 30 seconds, a one nautical mile in altitude, throttling engines down now to 68% as programmed. 38 seconds, plot board status looks good, mission control. 42 seconds, Columbia now three nautical miles in altitude. 46 seconds, coming up now and create a maximum aerodynamic pressure on the vehicle. 55 seconds, pass through max Q, still looking good. Throttling engines back to 100%. Give it a go at throttle up. Columbia Houston, you're go at throttle up. All right, we're going throttle up. We're going here too. Mark one minute, 10 seconds. Uh, Columbia now seven nautical miles in altitude, four nautical miles downrange. Velocity now reading 2,700 feet per second. 460, the last air speed, Houston. Roger, 460.
Mark, one minute, 25 seconds. Columbia now 11 nautical miles in altitude, 8 nautical miles down. Okay, range. we got a free on-move flight, Houston. Roger, we're looking. That was Jack uh, Lausmore reporting Houston, a free on-move flight. One minute, 40 seconds. Coming up on negative seats where altitude is too high for ejection seat use. Columbia, Houston, negative seats. Negative seats. Mark, one minute, 55 seconds. Columbia now, 21 nautical miles in altitude, 19 nautical miles down range. CC-50, Houston. Two minutes, two seconds. CC Standing 50. by for solid rocket booster separation confirmation. Okay, there's one all three. Two minutes, 15 seconds. Confirm solid rocket booster separation. Roger, Columbia. We confirm guidance converged. Two minutes, 23 seconds, onboard guidance is converging as programmed. Columbia is now steering for a precise window in space for main engine cutoff. So the interesting thing here was we went through the full two minutes there for that launch, but there's a question which I saw in chat which I brought up. Interesting to hear the call too high for ejection seat use. That was something which I always cringe a little bit about because I guarantee you that if they try to eject after launch, um, it might not have ended very well for them. I think, sorry, will you back me up on this one? I think ejection seats were a viable thing, but for only one part of the mission, which was just before landing. So say the main landing gear didn't come down, they could eject and then parachute onto near the runway, uh, rather than ejecting out during launch. What do you think? Uh, yeah, I think at that point it was mainly for that. There's never really was a sort of launch escape system that was designed to go with shuttle. Uh, I mean, they came up with ideas later down the line, like a, a literal pole that would stick out the side that the astronauts would slide off of. But yeah, I think it was more for that. And even if so, you're not going to want to risk using the ejection seats, especially with the SRB still attached. So if it was to even be considered during liftoff, it would be such a tiny window. It would. It would. We're going to do a quick some thanks again. I, again, I don't expect these, so I'm going to read them out anyway because it's very much appreciated. Daniel Hogbin gifted five OT memberships and then gifted another one after one, <laughs> straight afterwards. One gifted membership. So that's six. I'm keeping count. Matt's is back. Uh, what shuttle had the, which shuttle had the blown up tire during landing? I, it would have been the main landing gear, one of them, because they wouldn't have lost the nose gear. I don't think they've ever lost the nose gear tire ever so can you think we might have to check that one uh yeah i'm gonna have to look that one up yeah we're gonna have to look that up i know that i know the tires did so well so i'm kind of like hesitant to even think oh yes they had some blown tires i will very was, good uh, one it was the sts3 was it sts3 well we're gonna show that landing in a second so that's good timing <laughs> i mean i guess then... it makes sense when you see what happens yeah well, yeah, I mean, it's white sands, it was a gypsum, but I... I well, know I was, think the bounce also didn't help. It didn't, it was a rough, rough... I mean, it came in too fast. We'll show it in a second, because it is quite... It's the most dramatic landing in the shuttle history. Simple as that. Um, George got something from the store. Uh, another one for the wall. The wall dish gesture. So let's see if it'll show on screen. I don't know if it will with this, this setup, but let's just see if it comes up on, on screen. What George got from the store. Uh, it does show. It's the trifecta. It's the Starship trifecta. Is that Sean, Jack? I think that's that's Sean's trifecta. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Metal prints are cool. We have lots of them in the store. We won't do a massive store thing, but trust me, if you pop onto the store, in fact, I'll put it into chat. Oh, it's already beaten by Matt. Thank you, Matt. Matt's put the store thing in there. Go on, Metal Prints. You've got a wide selection. And trust me, my wall is covered in Metal Prints. And it's the you know happiest I've ever been with my wall. Yes, Jack? There's even some shuttle metal prints. <laughs> there is even some shuttle metal prints. It is as well. <laughs> the cool thing is, when you get a metal print, there's three things that helps you there. One, you look cool. You bring your friend around and go, look at my wall. You know, like out of um, Thor, where he goes, my stuff. You can do that to your friends because it's cool. Your wall looks amazing. It helps us because that's how commerce works. You buy things from us. We, get, you know, we, It helps us. But also it helps the photographer because the photographer in question who took that actual photograph, like this one here, right, with Sean, they get a cut as well on top of what we pay him. 
So it's like a, a nice little bonus. So it's a three-way help thing, if that makes any English sense at all. Let's move on to SGS3 landing. I just realized what time it is. <laughs> <laughs> we are going through the time. It's all right, because SGS3 is fun. Here we go. Ready for the wheelie, boys and girls? Airspeed 292. Coming Still Comes the gear. Gear down. 20. 10s, 5, 4, touchdown. Nose gears. 10s. Nose gears 5, 4, 3, 3. Touchdown. 10, the new ones, amigos. I'm looking at the tires now. I'm looking Me at the tires. Yeah, I didn't. I didn't see anything, but yeah, I was doing the same thing, trying to trying to see if I could see any kind of event happening. It yeah. looks like like such a minor little thing, you know. The nose went down, almost touched, and then went back up. Like, right, not a big deal, right? But when everything is so choreographed and rehearsed and trained over and over and over again, and when you have such a complex vehicle like this, yeah, it, it's actually a pretty big. It's actually a pretty big deal. Yeah, you and you think the speeds too. <laughs> Are there the Ele Elevons at the back, Jack? I don't know my planes. Uh, I do believe on the shuttle they are Elevons. I could be wrong. You know, different planes have different... You know, there's ailerons, there's Elevons, there's yeah. uh, a bunch of different control surfaces, but I do believe uh, the shuttle, th the proper term is Elevon. The problem here is they've come down really hard for a start. Let's just go back. I'm, I'm not going to do it in, in the actual real time. I'm going to do it in, like, frame by frame. They're coming back down. They are going and coming too fast. So that touchdown was too fast. You can see the left side touches, or the right side, sorry, from their perspective, touches first. I wonder if that's what got the tire. Because the tire's here. The other thing is, normally they would deploy the gear, I believe, about 400 feet off the deck, sometimes 250 to 400. This was 50 feet off the deck, as you heard on the call out. <laughs> so it basically, the gear locked into place maybe two seconds before touchdown, which is not nominal. <laughs> Here we go. You can see the ground already. They just opened the, do the doors for the... Because the, the payload, the, 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 the wheels come down by gravity, basically. That's how they come down. And they just pull down and then locked in place. So they come down, right? They're too and fast. They this just point. locked. <laughs> yeah. They're too fast. This is too fast. So that's why the nose is coming down, but they realize they're too fast. So they hold it there. They can't put the nose, cut, nose down at that point so they bring it back up again and watch the flaps at the back flappy flap flappy flap back down you come <laughs> and that's when they get a touchdown and apparently john young absolutely ripped them out for it because we they tried blaming i think some people were trying to blame the orbiter for the auto landing going wrong or something related to auto landing but well, um, i was gonna say yeah. is that yeah was this pilot induced oscillation because the shuttle is a is a fly-by-wire vehicle and that was relatively new at this time and there were a bunch of control authority um yeah challenges well, to work through in terms of getting the system tuned and getting the pilots used to it so that pilot induced oscillation you know like if you if you saturate the computer by telling it to pitch down and then by the time the computer's doing things to pitch down you're telling it to pitch up and then you just repeat that cycle you can enter into a uh what's i mean that's what it's called it's called pilot induced oscillation i don't know if that that was this or if this was that was just you know this was not a landing test no for this okay. one uh, actually part of the contributing factor as you mentioned is the auto land it's a feature that they were going to be testing, not on this flight particularly. You know, they were going to do some basic testing and then human land it. Auto land hadn't been a thing yet. Um, but it wasn't complete. So they tested it, they tried it, and just like certain planes, if you give it enough input on the control stick, it will disengage the autopilot. Uh, they did that this flight. They kind of moved it, but it didn't fully disconnect. And they didn't really notice it until very close to landing, which is also what came with the late gear down and then the speed discrepancy. So they accidentally left the autopilot kind of on. So that let's, was a contributing factor. Let's just factor. see if we can hear the call. I think the call is on this video. Still in auto. Wait for it. Wait for it. 
There you Airspeed go. 292. Still an auto. So there was still an auto. Here comes the gear. Gear down. Really interesting. STS3, I might have some pictures before I move quickly on to... Hang on, let me see where I'm going. There we are. <laughs> we'll go back to some landing pictures. Because it's it really also... fast. Go on, go on, sorry. Well, I was going to say, they also have to do a funky hack, I think, uh, because of the winds, rather than doing the normal slow kind of circle down towards the runway. It was kind of just one sharp 90-degree turn. Yeah, look at this. The real nice views because this is the only time they landed at White Sands. This is the only time you'll ever see this in photographs with the two T-38s escorting the orbiter back down really close together. Look at how close they get. Because the calls you'll hear about when they're like 10 feet, 5 feet, 3 feet, they're coming from the chase plane. The chase plane is watching them. That's where the readouts are coming from. And they're telling the, the, the commander and the pilot on board the orbiter uh, how long to go before they actually touch down. It's really kind of cool. Like, that's what I did in the early days. And then we saw the mess of Columbia's TPS. No. Not great at all, that. It's not the worst one, though. That's a future short Sunday. So, yeah, do you want to preempt which was the worst one, the worst TPS damage on an orbiter that actually got back to land? Uh, you mean STS-27? Yeah, Atlantis. <laughs> that one got at all. That's a future shot of Sunday. Loads of cool photographs here. Oh, that's well, the Jack picture there. <laughs> what's crazy is how dusty it was. The fact that all the way up until its final flight, there was still dust that was found floating around the vehicle. Yeah. They were still finding gypsum, like, years and years and years afterwards, apparently, according to the shuttle guys. And yep. they just yep. didn't like it. And I mentioned the Robin Williams song, um, the great late comedian, who did a, a wake-up call on a future shuttle mission, and it was it included the line, land at White Sands, no way. And it was like, because they really hated White Sands, and it was like not even an in-joke. They, they made it a public joke. And Robin Williams did this amazing. I will find it for Future Shuttle Sunday. I don't know if the copyright will still be on it or whatever, but uh, you, can, you can YouTube it. Robin Williams' wake-up song, Shuttle. And you'll hear it. And it's a really cool song that he wrote. He is a genius comedian. I, I, I yep. severely miss him. Brilliant, brilliant person. Yeah. So... And, the, the gypsum, the sand at White Sands is made out, it's like really, really fine gypsum. So it's like, yes, it is sand, but it's not like, you know, coarse beach sand that you, you might be thinking of. It's a, it's a much finer uh, material. And so, yeah, once, once it got in there, that was that. I should have pressed click on the Matt's question about the tire. Matt, we're going to work on that, by the way, because that's intriguing. I do love it when we get a shuttle Sunday and we get a lot of other shuttle fans in because there's absolutely no way I'm an expert on shuttle. I, I know about shuttle, but there's so many people who like can collectively get right into the depth of shuttle because it's really cool. This is the um, what they use for the make, the make device, which basically cranes and pulley system that, as I mentioned, they, they trained in. Uh, to White Sands to set that up. I've got more photographs of it as well. Look at this setup here. <laughs> Isn't that... That's, that's crazy. You've got the purse looks, truck still there. It almost looks like something you'd see in Starbase. Yeah. It, exactly. That's when we get... We're fascinated by the cranes. There's probably some, like, you know, back of the memory kind of, like, thing going on there. That's a brilliant photograph that just shows how much was involved there to get the orbiter ready to be transported onto the back of the SC-8. Look, there's your nose. There's your tail cone. <laughs> Yay! Tail cone. Boo, boo, tail, tail cone, cone flank. <laughs> we like stubby nozzles and tail cones. <laughs> boo! Look at, this. Look at this. I've got a plane picture for you, Jack, to make up for it. Look at this. Oh, yeah. I'm all about it. That is really cool. And that's lifted. How did they do it? They're lifting the orbit on the back of the SCA and they did a piggyback ride and they called it a piggyback ride. Really cool. Lots and lots of pictures. I, again, all in L2, and I will dump them all in Discord if you remember. Capcom and above, and we'll put them everywhere so everyone gets to see them. STS-4. This is the last of test flights. This is STS-4. Again, Columbia. A really cool, that's a cool, cool picture of the... S Look at this one here. This is great. Hang on, I've gone too far. Gone too big. It's always, it's always crazy to me seeing uh, like camera shots and remote shots of shuttle launches and sort of 
kind of recognizing places around Kennedy Space Center where you're like, I'm, I feel like I might have put a camera there before. <laughs> it's pretty <laughs> cool. What's the cool thing about STS-4's crew? Pop quiz. STS-4's crew? I'll give you a clue. Measles. Oh, uh, <laughs> it was Ken Mattingly who flew it, right? Yes, yes, having never got the measles. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's right, if you watched Apollo 13, the movie, they, they did the whole thing about Ken Mattingly not being on the crew because he, he was, I think he was at risk of getting the measles and they didn't want him to get the measles and ruin the mission. So he was taken off it, but they ended up being an integral part of rescuing the crew. And then at the end of the movie, it goes, Ken Mattingly then got to fly on the space shuttle. And that's this is one the SCS four. This is really cool. Also, fun fact about this launch that we're looking at: this is extremely rare in shuttle history. Yeah. This launch was the first one in the program's history to launch exactly on time as published. <laughs> well, that didn't last long, did it? <laughs> no. Oh my word! <laughs> this is where the photographers look at this. This is kind of like these are NASA photographers. Actually, this is not a NASA photographer. This is one of the people in L two. We've got one of our community. They've uploaded their own photograph. That is so cool. A really nice pictures. Yeah, Woods. And we've got all these photographs here. They're out of order because again, people are just uploading from their collections and stuff like that, which is how it works. Really cool. We get we get shuttle guys who sometimes we've had experience in L two where a space shuttle. We've got a lot of space shuttle people because that's how we started, and you can imagine that's why we call the site what it is and what have you. Um, they've gone into a loft and found like actual physical photographs in collections in boxes, and we've then gone out and arranged for them to be scanned and made digital and then put into L two. So they've been never been on the internet before, which is really really cool. Not all the time, but sometimes. This is obviously not. One of those photographs is from really cool landing picture from a T thirty eight. Look at the angle of descent there as well. The T thirty eight is trying to keep up. <laughs> to, to use an aerospace term, that is uh, fairly spicy. It's fairly spicy. <laughs> Beautiful photograph, though. I must admit, that is. I'm looking at the old worm logo on the side there. Oh, happier days. Really cool. I'm going to show the launch first. This is a shorter video again, so we're not going to run out too much time here. There we go. Let's press, press the right things here. SGS4 launch. We have made it. Four, three, two, one. And we have solid motor ignition and liftoff. Liftoff of America's space shuttle on its fourth mission, and we have cleared the tower. It's amazing how the quality of the video gets worse on SGS4. There is. <laughs> Fancy graphics. Yes, it's like the early days before Spikes just got involved and <laughs> did all the telemetry on board <laughs> on the screen. Really cool. But yeah, that's that's honestly safe from like an old tape, which is what the times would have been in that time. But this is the landing video. This is where it gets really fun because the landing's fine. The landing is very nominal. But it's just what the event was. It was July the fourth. Uh, astronauts who have already flown the shuttle. Americans took quite seriously. See if we can't pick up more communications now between the spacecraft <laughs> and the ground. So you got President Reagan, you got Nancy Reagan there. He's been well with previous shuttle there by people. Previous shuttle well, pilots. Turning into a heading uh, lined up with the runway now. Yeah, I spied a Bob Cripp in there. He should be yes. in automatic uh, control at this point in time, and will probably maintain. The, the only time three officers to be together. Enterprise. Next to Mr. Feet. President Reagan. Challenger on the I SCA. Waiting to go to KC. Automatic Columbia landing. Right to the deck before he takes over. 
with the conveniently planned flyover right after the landing. Yes, it was so well done, though. It's always a beautiful sight. You will get to see this. I did some bandy coming. up with the runway, Whoa. turning uh, in on what we might, what we call final at this point in time. But she's and I believe that this is the first shuttle away. to land on pavement. Feet. Yes, first time on tarmac. Yes. There's, look, there's Challenger coming up. You'll see. Oh, I don't know if I'm talking too soon, but there's you'll see the Challenger there. waiting. Yeah. Oh, yeah. There, it is. there, there she wow. is. What a shot. She'll Not just down. gently come down. Keep it coming, Ken. Keep it coming. He's a little Gears fast. Down like. Stand by for touchdown. touchdown. There it is. Touchdown. There's the dust. Ryan Payton saying our graphics department's in shambles right now. <laughs> so yes, there's three launch graphics. Outstanding <laughs> job. There's the speed brake on the other speed brake. <laughs> he heard you, Gene. He heard you. That's Brewster Shaw, the Capcom, echoing that. Outstanding. Well, let's see how much runway he uses now. Shuttle control here. The unofficial landing time: seven days, one hour, nine minutes, forty seconds. We were about to the unofficial landing time. I had to take a bit. That's the bit where they meet the crew. Seconds. Here we go. Well, we're about 14 <laughs> seconds early, but we lifted off on time, Frank. Lift, lifted off the ramp as the space uh, astronauts return from space. Yeah, you might need to boost this part of the audio. I remember it was quite a low volume for some reason on this part. If you can hear us, I'll gauge in the background. <laughs> this was the first time that Mr. Reagan has seen it's not a, vital. Uh, space shuttle return. And this is... Uh, and Hartsfield coming down now. Also, the final time that we will see astronauts wearing the pressurized suits until, uh, I believe, STS-26. And the astronauts, the president shaking hands with Mattingly and with Hartsfield, and Mrs. Reagan giving each one of them Watch a kiss. This, uh, first Lady touches Columbia here. Look at that. Mrs. Mrs. Reagan does what just there we go. everybody would like to do, walk up and touch <laughs> the thing. Does that count as a boot? Think yeah, it does count as a boot. <laughs> <laughs> does count as a boot. Yeah. Florida First lady boot. I believe they're ready to take off. Look at this. Challenger, this you are free to take off now. It's so choreographed, but it's so well done. I feel like that's free to take job. Off. Not the and president's job to say you're here to take <laughs> off. We introduce right. to you two sons of Auburn. Captain T.K. Mattingly and Colonel Hank Hartsfield. God bless you all. And a happy 4th of July. This is where it gets surreal. President Reagan starts singing to the uh, Challenger. Here it comes. Stand beside us and guide us through the night with a light from above. What an event, though. That happened. That Jack, you up. do you have a story you had to tell us about this? Something I remember you saying, remind me. I'm reminding you. Yeah, well, burning. So this was the, this is where they, you know, the test flights are over. You know, this is the completion of STS-4. And the shuttle is declared operational. And it's like, yay, America, rah, rah, rah. We have the shuttle. We're so great. Um, My question to you, Chris, is... Mm -hmm. Do you agree with <laughs> declaring the shuttle operational after four test flights? Oh, my word. Um, well, considering the first, floor, first four flights were all about testing out the operational assets of the orbiter, which include the space shuttle remote manipulated system, um, return and landing, obviously. Uh, it's a tough it's a tough one because they were still launching with just two crew members and I think to be operational you need to test it with a full crew, which is usually seven. Six or seven. It's a good question. Um I'm thinking back and I, I can't see any missteps where they're thinking they should have had more test flights from five onwards. Here's here's my my angle. 
Uh, and I'm, I don't even, I'm pretty sure this is in a book or something. Like, I'm not, I, don't, I take no credit for this line of thinking, but Shuttle was so new and so innovative and in trying to do so many things that had never been done before in spaceflight that to declare it operational at flight after flight four and just say like, cool, we, we know how to do this. We're good to go. No, you know, no more further work needed. Let's start launching payloads. I mean, yeah, sure. Start launching payloads. But we always talk Chris about Starship being the vehicle that shuttle, you know, wanted to be, we, we call Starship shuttle 2.0, like unironically. And I really think, in a lot of ways, things would have gone much different if the shuttle program was allowed to, you know, if it was it was able to be recognized as more of a crazy, innovative thing that we were trying to do. And if we didn't just stop and sort of solidify things around Flight 4, like if we had kept trying to improve the system and then maybe put some money towards flyback solids or or flyback boosters or just any of the number of things that that got deferred in the in the funding you know rigmarole that has to happen in order to make these things work bureaucratically but yeah I just I don't know I, I I ask because it always kind of irked me like the shuttle was yes it flew four successful test flights yes they were ready to move on to the next phase of the program but to just think like, yeah, we're good to go. I'm <laughs> really, really, really kind of bothers me. I wish at some point during the shuttle program, we had been able to sort of take all the lessons learned from shuttle version one and put that into, you know, shuttle version two, whether that yeah. was an actual STS thing or whether that was X33 or any, any number of opportunities where we could have said, okay, we have accomplished a huge amount with, the STS program. Let's take everything that we've learned and make the next step. And ho hopefully, you know, we would have been able to get closer to the two flights a month original goal and all of that. So, and I don't know. I just a uh, just a a thought. Um, it always kind of bothered me. And it's like, yep, it's operational. We're good to go. It's like, no, no, no that's not how this works. Sorry, what do you think? Cause I'm, I'm also going to add the caveat that it was a different kind of era. And it is now. There's, uh, even, you go back to Apollo is even more of a bigger thing because risk was acceptable. I can't see the risks of the space shuttle program in the early test flights being applied to today. I don't think it ever happened. Look at Boeing Starliner. You know, as soon as they thought any part of the tape on the parachute was potentially flammable, they cancelled the mission literally, and re you know, put a six month delay on it. The space shuttle was more risk. I mean, Apollo was even more risk than that. Do you think that four test flights was enough, Sawyer? I mean, like you said, it was definitely the risk. Having the first flight have crew on it is absolutely insane. And as you mentioned, yeah. will probably never happen again. Uh, I mean, I still feel like some of those early flights were still developmental and uh, kind of proving flights, even if they weren't named as such. I mean, that's when you're still getting into the, all right, now let's see how it operates as a science laboratory. Let's see how it works as a satellite deployment mechanism. See how the cannon arm can be used. See what can be done for the U.S. military. So I don't think it really left its sort of uh, non-operational fully phase until later on in the program. It's just we stopped calling it that at STS-4. Right. Yeah. Which, you know, you have to make Congress happy. You have to have the PR win of like, oh, look how great we are. Or look at how great our space program is. So I get it politically. Um, but yeah. Anyways, that's, I'll, I'll get off my soapbox. Also, you... chat, chat, what do you think, by the way? Well, sorry, 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 sorry. But chat, what do you think to that question? Let's see what other people's opinions are at the same time. Yeah. And Jack, you mentioned the SRP boost back I mean, obviously SpaceX has kind of nailed something similar now, but uh, STS-4, while we're talking about it, was one of only two missions that did not recover the SRBs due to uh, either hard impacts or, in the case of the second flight, uh, flight termination system activation on 51L. 
There we go. Very good. Uh, yeah, Astro Joe says, Go Fever led to challenges to demise. That's true. In 1985, they launched about 12 missions or something, and we were going to go for more on, a, on a, um, 1986, and they really had Go Fever because there was lots of things in play, like State of the Union event address was that night, and there was some kind of pressure to make sure they had a, a teacher in space for that speech. Lots of random stories behind that. Don't know if it's true or not, but lots of random stories behind that. Go Fever situation. That absolutely was true, by the way. Go Fever was not speculation. It was something that came up in the Rogers report. The Rogers Commission, I should say. About putting the... Um, I think the Marshall Space Flight Director said, you do not stop a moving train once it's moving. Oh, horrendous quotes from it. They really are things you would not happen today, thankfully, because the lessons have been learned. Um, v, v2 Rex. I never know how to pronounce your name. I'll put it on the screen so people know what I'm talking about. Uh, after the shuttle series, how about a history lesson on Saturn? That'd be tough for me because we have some experts in that as well, so we could bring them on maybe if they're willing to do that because that'd be fun. We've got lots of photographs and videos of that as well, so that'd be kind of cool. Um, I know Ian's a big Saturn Five fan. He is, get, yeah. But we can get Ian might, on. He's also an Aries fan, so that kind of lets him down. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> oh dear me and hazelnut yeah hazelnut this is the problem with youtube a pity the youtube bomb both launch videos without each uh just let you know no it's not your fault of course yeah it's not our fault but the the fun thing is record these so they're, the recording will have that problem i don't believe because the live stream is different set up than a, a recorded video gets published so we do record these and when we press stop on the record we'll get it uploaded and we'll have links and i'll make sure we put the links <laughs> look at this ryan caton is asking for aries sunday that's not happening <laughs> but um yes we do record these so once we put the recording you'll be able to watch it back and your pleasure go back to those launch parts without the interruption of the ad that's how it should work at least but thank you. I appreciate your point because I didn't know that myself. So it's good to know. We can make sure that the recording goes up not too long afterwards. But on that bombshell, I think we'll call that a day. It's been fun. It's gone really fast. We've done an hour and 20 minutes. And I, we're, I thought we will do an hour and we'll make sure we do three missions to make sure we cover an hour. We end up going over. So that was just really cool. But let me just say, say thanks first and foremost to Jack for being on. Thanks, Jack. Yeah, absolutely. I feel like we could do an hour and twenty minutes on a single mission. Like, oh, easy. It's yep. all it's all just up to <laughs> what the uh, benevolent SCL viewers are uh, willing to tolerate. But yeah, always down for Shuttle Sunday. Glad we're doing these. Yeah, and thank you also to Sawyer. Thank you, Sawyer. Oh, are you kidding me? This is <laughs> this is a pleasure to be here and talk about all this. It's I, I watching the launch video of Shuttle. With the modern day VAB on the right side of the screen, I don't know why it it just brought me back to the mid two thousands when I really got interested and started following all the shuttle flights. It just felt like we were back in the space shuttle era, and I loved it. Yeah, I mean, shuttle. We I tend to digress on wrapped sides and making sure it's like a shuttle reference in there somewhere. I can't help it; it's just the way it is. Where you've been brought up and where you've been like, where you got into your interest into space flight. But we'll have lots more shuttle Sundays to come. We look for a spare Sunday. There's like museum shows. Sometimes I'll have an interview or whatever. And that no, maybe even a Starlink launch. It's amazing that a Starlink launch stays. Usually a Starlink launch every other day. But when there's a spare Sunday, we'll make sure we do these. It'd be interesting what we do next. I think we'll do like an STS five to. You know, the, the early flights, the early operational flights and find something interesting. We'll have standalones for things like Hubble missions and what have you because they're really cool. And the big deep space astronomy like Chandra. I mean, STS-93 is going to be its own mission <laughs> on a short Sunday oh. alone. That's guaranteed. Right. And then one day we'll do like a shuttle mission. We'll probably do a modern one. Uh, a modern one, I say a modern one. It's been over a decade since the shuttle retired. But we'll take one of those later missions where we've got lots of video assets, really good quality video assets of the entire countdown and things like that. And we'll do like a live launch day as if we're covering it on a live stream, a space shuttle mission. So we would literally be commentating over it as if it was live. And they'd be like, and then it's a live stream of a launch, but shuttle. And we'll do it in that kind of perspective where it's really kind of cool because like, no one's ever done that, really, especially not on an NSF channel, where we've done a shuttle launch as if it was live. So that's something we're going to think of doing at one point in the future. But I'm rambling. And I always do that under these these live streams. So I'm going to make sure I don't ramble too much longer. I don't know if we get a moo at the end of these, like we do on Raptor Sides. So I, I'm going to say thanks for joining us and goodbye for now. And we'll see what happens. 